you know, very happy for them to be able to go to teams and have an opportunity to do something really special with a new group of guys. And uh, it's tough to see something like this come to an end, but uh, everything does uh, eventually. Welcome to Baseball Biz. I'm Mark Carvin, your host, and with me is Mr. Brandon No Way. How you doing, Brandon? I'm doing really good, Mark. How about you? I am doing fantastic. Actually, it feels more like a hangover. I mean, after the MLB <laughs> trade deadline last week, it's like my head's still dizzy. I need a couple of uh, alka seltzer or something to get cracking. Yeah, it's. we had all the excitement last week, and it, it slowed down a little bit this week, but there's still plenty to talk about. Well, this week, you know, I think you and I should look at this like detectives. You know, and, and I, I wondered sometimes if anybody had a clue about what was happening on MLB uh, trade deadline week, but uh, we definitely saw some results. Some teams more than others make it a big dent. Yeah, we had two teams and two teams that won championships recently, as, as soon as two years ago, basically blowing up their team. And even though they had the same idea of doing things, they both seem to have different results and ways of going about it. Oh, no doubt. As you all may have heard at the beginning of the show, we actually played a bit from Jake Arrieta, you know, one of the few remaining Cubs from the World Series who still left there after the, uh, after the extreme changes that General Manager Jed Hoyer, I think he's also president of the Cubs, made. And we'll, we'll talk about some of those. You know what? I tell you what, Brandon, why don't we go ahead first and we'll play some of Jed Hoyer's comments about what he had to say about the decisions he made. You know, listen, uh, we, we played great in, in, in May. We, we, were, we played really well leading into June. And, I mean, honestly, like we were preparing and scouting to, to be buyers. And, um, you know, we lost 11 games in a row. Um, the Brewers took off and uh, we were never going to you know, going to be able to catch them. And obviously this year we're not, we're not wildcard contenders because of what's, what's happening, happening in the NL West. So, you know, listen, I think we got to a place where it was uh, at least to, to me, it was a very clear and obvious uh, decision, which is we have all these players for two more months in two more months. These guys are you know, going to have the ability uh, to walk away via free agency and um, we did everything we could to acquire assets for the future. And uh, I mean, some of those conversations and um, moments were you know, incredibly difficult because these are players that um, have been a part of the, you know, the best Cubs run in, in history. You know, we, um, we came in here in 2011 uh, with the goal of you know, creating a young wave of talent. And uh, we did that. And um, we, we won, you know, we won a World Series. We went to the playoffs five times. We went to three NLCSs. And um, this group has, you know, should be incredibly proud of, of what we accomplished. But, you know, the nature of our sport is our cycles. And we were at the end of the, of the, um, the service time clock with these players. You know, we, were, we weren't able to, to reach extensions. And so, you know, we could either hold these players for two months um, and uh, have them compete um, for a fourth place team, or we could uh, do everything we could in our power to um, reset our farm system, to reset our organization. And I think we accelerated um, that incredibly over the last, you know, 10 days or so. Oh, okay. Okay. I, I get some of that. I, I realize it's, it's time to, to move on. It's time to say, okay, I, I've got some really great players here, but, uh, you know, I, I've offered them a, some extensions and it just didn't work out. So, but there's, there's more to this. And we'll talk about that a little further on because I don't think Anthony Rizzo necessarily agreed with Hoyer. And further on in that interview with Jed Hoyer, some reporters ask questions that I sometimes feel like are targeted for failure. You know, it's like, hey, uh, oh, and Jed, didn't was it because of players' greed that that you weren't able actually to close these deals? What what what, what do you say to <laughs> something like that? You know, but but we'll get into a little bit more of that in a few moments. So so what were the results with the Cubs? I mean, 
with the trade deadline, we said we're not going to hit everybody, but we will talk about the, the, the Cubs and the Nats. And when we look at the Cubs, I mean, there was three primary players who got all the coverage as far as the trades. You know, there was, there was Anthony Rizzo. And, you know, he, this is a guy who's performed quite well for a long time with him. Yeah, he was a really key piece to their uh, their World Series run. He made many All Star games. I believe he even won an MVP a few years ago. So he was a big piece, and all all these guys were Rizzo as well, Javi Baez, Craig Kimbrell was a pretty big piece in their run, especially this year. He was such a good closer for them. He didn't win a World Series with them, but he was a key piece to them. He ended up getting traded off, and all of this really came from. You know, different factors. They couldn't get him re-signed. And like you said, more on that here in a little bit. But also, what they really ran into a problem was the way that their arbitration and everything lined it up. They were all going to be hitting free agency at the same time. So if they were going to want to keep them all, they would have to shell out a ton of money all at once. Yeah, and I guess the Ricketts family who owned the, the, the Cubs just weren't ready to do that. Uh, but uh, let, let's start by looking at, at Anthony Rizzo. This for, what he's a first baseman. He's three times he's he's been at the All Star. Uh, he's he's won MVP several times as you were mentioning earlier, Silver Slugger Award, four times Golden Glove, and see, I think he started with the Padres way back in the win, but became a Cub shortly thereafter. And the the conflict at this decision to, I guess, not negotiate and sign him, but to trade him. has had a, a lot of uh, a lot of fans not too pleased, and, and certainly not Mr. Rizzo. And a lot of times there seems to be, you know, while it is a, a business decision, it's, it's also you look at building a team almost as a family. And when you don't come together on something as simple as what's going to be a worthy price to continue, there's more than just friction in a business deal. It's family as well. And that family extends, extends to the fans. I was going to say, I did have a report from CBS on what was allegedly what they offered. Oh, do tell. Rizzo. Well, I'll start off before I get into what he offered them. He was talking with Jesse Rogers of ESPN, and he said, I don't know why guys didn't want to sign. I don't know why, why guys didn't want to even counter offer some oftentimes. Every one of these guys would say they wanted to stay in Chicago. We wanted to be a cub. But then we would sit down and do negotiations. That wasn't how they acted. Oh. Which I've never negotiated. But from what I know, you're probably not supposed to let, you know, personal things get involved with it. It's supposed to be business. Now, now that's that's the Hoyer. That's Jed Hoyer. That's the GM saying that. Is that correct? That's correct. But a report came out in the, earlier this spring indicated, or well, before I get into that, it, it was reported that Rizzo's camp was trying to get a Paul Goldschmidt type deal because they're, they play the same position, similar ages, and similar production levels, which is about five million hundred or not $5 million, Five years, $130 million. So they were trying to get that. And from what they reported in the spring, the Cubs offered Rizzo five years, but only $70 million. So just over half of what they probably wanted to get. And I don't, that would seem kind of insulting to offer one of your better players, even though his production has fallen off just a little bit, half of what he wants. And I don't blame him if he didn't counter offer. Yeah. I, I mean, that, that just doesn't make sense. You know, you know when you, you go to buy a house, you go ahead and offer a counter offer, and if it's the offer uh, is just too stupid to be considered, well, then you know you just say, well, I'll let it that offer expire. And if you've got enough sense, you'll figure to come back with something reasonable. Because if if I'm talking one thirty and you're talking seventy, you're just crazy to think I'm going to be coming anywhere near that seventy number. Uh, come back to me again, so I, I can see why he wouldn't do a counter offer. Yeah, and if he got the chance to go to free agency, wouldn't you even just test to see what you can get, even though Hoyer is saying that he believes that they made fair offers to everybody? Yeah. But this does seem very fair to me. No, 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 no. You know, I'm, I there is the face that the organization will put on. 
to show us as as fans. And that isn't necessarily what's going on. I mean, a lot of times when I've been in negotiations in the past, I've been told by some other, my mentor, she said, you know, Mark, listen to what's going on in the room and realize that what's being said isn't necessarily what's being said. I said, well, what, what, what do you mean? She goes, well, the negotiation, there's actually something underneath the conversation. There's something that's trying to be achieved or not achieved by that conversation. And I think that's the case with what happened with Anthony Rizzo and the other Cubs. The real thing wanted to do is they wanted to let them go. They wanted to let them, you know, move on. They wanted to rebuild. And there's nothing wrong with it. I think the thing that sticks in a lot of people's craw is they feel that there's a duplicity there that, oh, yes, we, we offered an extension. Yeah, but no, you really didn't. Yeah. T- to me, it seems like, you know, if you just came out and said, hey, we offered an extension, he didn't take it. You, if that's all that comes out, fans will say, hey, they tried. They couldn't get that done. But when it's something like this with that big of a gap between it, it's like, did you really try? And, you know, I don't blame them either for doing what they did because them and the Nationals seem like they're in the same boat where they got the most that they could out of this core and they probably can't do anything more after this. So they're going to trade them away, get all the best pieces that they can and rebuild. But it just seems like the way it's been handled that makes it so bad and not good like unlike the nationals who handled it i believe in a better way but we can get more into that later yeah yeah i I think that's the difficulty because when a general manager tries to what i want to say put put a happy face on something that doesn't have a happy face (laughs) you know just just go ahead come up and say own up to this is what we're trying to do what we're going to do and it didn't work out don't even pretend and spend your time and the players and agents time to think that you're actually going to grant them an extension when the numbers are obviously so low that they will not agree to it. And I think that's the, the point that's, uh, that's kind of sad. Now, let me, let me say something else here real quick, too. You and I both have had the pleasure of talking with Sarah Sanchez from Be- uh, Bleed Cubby Blue. You know, she if you guys haven't looked up uh, Bleed Cubby Blue, please do so. Sarah's also on Twitter as well. Uh, man. I was talking with her, I guess, a couple of weeks before the trade deadline came. And I said, hey, how's it going with Jed Hoyer? I said, are you uh, got any inkling of what's coming? And she goes, Mark, he's not really all that transparent. And you know, you and I both know from past conversations, Jed Hoyer's, uh, I guess you could say mentor and uh, fellow, uh, the guy be- who was there before him, was Theo Epstein. And who I think a lot of people looked at as, kind of a pinnacle of what a good GM should be. But I don't think Jed Hoyer has enjoyed that same, oh, what do I want to say, popularity. Yeah, it seems like he hasn't enjoyed that popularity, and it seems like the Rickett family, it seems like they've lost the popularity as well. Even some people want them to sell the team. Well, tell me about that. You did some research, and it was interesting because you were finding, <laughs> I guess it was back in January this year, wasn't it, that uh, some fans and such were, were already – uh I guess, crying out at the Ricketts family in the organization. Yeah, Ryan Anthony Dreyer, he wrote an opinion piece on ONTAP Sportsnet about how Tom Ricketts should sell the Cubs. And they've owned the team for about 11 years, and they they bought the team when it was valued at $700 million. This year, the Cubs are worth $3.2 billion, and the Ricketts family is currently worth $3.1 billion. So a combined... Over six billion dollar network. Good gravy. And earlier this year, February twenty second to be exact, they launched Marquee Sports Network, which is an estimated hundred million dollars in revenue. And on September third, they're entering a hundred million dollar partnership with DraftKings to be the first MLB franchise to integrate sports betting into the experience. So they're doing a whole lot of more things to bring in more revenue, and it seems like they're crying the "Oh, woes me, I'm poor." routine yeah well that's that just doesn't really cut it with fans i mean what his call i guess is asking the rickets to sell yeah and and on the jed hoyer track he's not a big fan of him just from what he said because even we said this you can go back and listen to those shows 
the Cubs received for you, Darvish, not a single prospect ranked in the top 10 of the Padres farm system. And they didn't get a pitcher back because they're starved for pitching both in the minors and the majors. That was back in January. They also didn't receive a catching prospect. They got Victor Caratini, who was a backup catcher. And he said that this is basically reeks of a salary dump, which I believe we agreed on all the way back in, I believe it was January when this went down. Just a little bit more context. Darvish started off the season hot, but he's cooled off. This year he's 7-6 and six with a 3.48 ERA. And last seven starts has gone 1-4 and four with a 5.50 ERA and 37 and two-thirds. Zach Davies, who the Cubs back in return, who is basically the only major league ready pitcher, over the year, he is 6-8 and eight with a 4-79 and 79 ERA, 112 and two-thirds innings pitched, and his last seven starts has gone 1-4, 594 ERA, and 33 and a thirds innings. Mm. So a lot to be desired there on that deal. Yeah, so I, I don't know, man. It's after, after Theo left, I just really had to be concerned about how things were going to go. And now that Theo is underneath the MLB umbrella, you know, he's not going to be giving advice to a specific team. I don't know. I am I can only wonder if if he and uh, Jed were texting back and forth and, you know, with Theo be saying, what the hell? You know, jeez. Uh, <laughs> the, the, the fans are, and, and it's obvious by this, the story you tell there. And, oh, and, and I saw when we talked about Sarah Sanchez earlier, she retweeted somebody who they're holding a, they were holding a wake, a wake for the Chicago oh. Cubs. Yeah, it it does seem like the end of an era. Which I mean, with all the success they've had, you wouldn't. I wouldn't. Don't blame you for being sad. It's going to come for our teams one year. It's going to come for the Bucks. It's going to come for the Lightning. It's going to come for the Rays one year. That day is going to come, and a lot of these guys will be gone. And he closed his article with this little section. I want to quote from him. I will forever be grateful to everyone involved who orchestrated the first Cubs World Series title in 108 years. My father passed away in 2015 and was deprived of the chance to see the Cubs as champions in his lifetime. This is not lost on me, but I also refuse to sit by and accept the deja vu inducing direction the team seems to be heading once more. Wow. I mean, that that hits home, doesn't it? I mean, I feel bad for these people. Very, very much so. And, uh, you know, what... uh... Hoyer and Epstein were part of this decision making in 2011, as early as that. You know, they brought Madden along. They got aggressive with who they were getting, and they they got a World Series. So, I guess you get hungry for another World Series, and you say, "Well, the varsity team should now be in a softball beer league somewhere instead of here." And so, I'm not going to pay them anymore. <laughs> I need to get those other young guys. And hey. And it seems like they had the right idea. They traded away all their, their good prospects to get major league talent to try to win another World Series. I mean, nobody blames you for doing that. I think it just seems like the way that this the ending was handled, you yeah. know, the low-balling offers, the trading away pieces for less than what they're worth. I think that's what's the biggest thing here is that they're a big, big market team who's operating like a small market team. Well... Anthony Rizzo certainly had to speak back out, and uh, he had a few words to say about Jed Hoyer. Should we play those here? I don't know if we have them. Do you, maybe we should insert these or not. What do you think? If we don't have the audio, I have. I can read the quote off for you. If yeah, go like. ahead. And let's let's hear what you got from uh, Hoyer. I mean, from no, no, no. This is not from Hoyer. This is from Anthony Rizzo, the guy who was traded to the Yankees. Yeah, well, and uh, a little bit backstory. I believe you may have heard it, but. Hoyer said that that would probably be his greatest source of frustration from this whole era is not re-signing everybody, but he goes to sleep every night knowing he put his best foot forward, which we'll all throw our head, backs, head back and laugh. Rizzo was asked on earlier this week on a show called The Cap and Jay Hood Show, and he, he said, I'm kind of confused on why, why say that. Sounds like a bad breakup and the person saying they're fine when they're not fine. I think it can speak for itself that there is a common denominator that no one signed. Whoever wants to dig into that can, I just think that we had such great memories there. And to come out and say that, it doesn't really make sense. But it is what it is. And I I couldn't help but think of the scene from Friends where Ross was drunk saying, I'm fine. (laughs) 
<laughs> That's, I, I couldn't help but think of that after he said that line. That's appropriate. Oh, my gosh. Well, the funny thing is, he said that before you discovered uh, you discovered the common denominator. And it's like, they ain't ponying <laughs> up any cash. Yeah, I mean, that would be a pretty good common denominator <laughs> to leave. Yeah. And, I mean, when, at the end of the day, business is business. And if you were offered a job, you had a job you loved. And if they couldn't pay you the money that you deserved, so you had another job offer with a place that was going to pay you the money you deserve and you get a fresh start. Wouldn't you be at least interested in talking about that? One would hope, but, uh, you know, this, uh, he's the GM. He controls the purse strings. He can make these decisions. But, uh, I, I certainly respect about how Anthony Rizzo felt about being traded to the Yankees, but he has made the most of that. I'd say that much. And if, Hoyer wanted to get him back now. Well, let's say Mr. Rizzo's stock's gone up a lot in the last week. I mean, he's on fire, isn't he? Yeah, yeah. Well, the man said what? Six games for the Yankees since he's been traded. So just this past week, he's played six games. He's played in each one of them. Each game, he's had what an RBI. And three of those games, he's had a home run in. And this actually, what his achievement in these last six, last six days breaks Yankee records. I think both in home runs and in RBIs. So that, that's huge. So what did the Yankees get? They got, a, like I said, a three-times American All-Star there. He's uh, MVP several times, four-time Golden Glove. You know, this is a guy, Silver Slugger. <laughs> There's merit here, people, and he's showing Jed Hoyer right now, guess what you're missing. Yeah, and not only is he hitting home runs and RBIs, but he's hitting 400 and has an OPS of 1.369. So, I mean, he's... I know it's only a week, but he's been on fire lately, and he's really, really helped out that Yankee offense. Well, he's the kind of guy who's going to keep baseball interesting and exciting for a lot of people, not just Cubs or Yankees fans. But uh, kudos to you, Anthony, and we hope that you uh, continue to succeed with the Yankees unless you're playing one of my teams. Uh, but, <laughs> but who else? So Javi Baez, Chris Bryant, and Craig Kimbrell were also trades that the Cubs made. And I'll say one thing about Chris Bryant. You and I have had our conversations before about Chris Bryant because he, we felt like we felt like the Cubs sharded him a year of service before he could become a free agent. They they brought him up like one day short or one day you know of, of being able to have an entire year in a major league, and that really stunk. So I don't think Chris Mines actually leaving. You know there. He plus he who's he going with now? The San Francisco Giants, and and these guys are doing great guns. You know they're banging it out. They're you talk about making a difference. Uh, he's gone to a team that uh, has real possibility. One of the things Hoyer did say is he was trying to reinvent this team and get these players out somewhere where uh, I guess a team that had a possibility this year while while the Cubbies Cubbies don't. And Chris Bryant is definitely there. Again, we're looking at a guy, let's see, 2015, he was Rookie of the Year. He played, he's been an all-star, MVP. Uh, I have no idea what the conversations were as far as an extension with Bryant, but I think there was already a little bad blood there in the first place, and he would have gone on anyway. Yeah, I imagine if Rizzo was lowballed like that, I imagine Bryant and Baez probably were as well. That could be the common denominator there. And he's had a pretty good run with the Giants so far, not to the level of Rizzo's. He's only played in four games, hitting two thirty one, has a homer and an RBI, which came in his first game, and has an OPS of seven forty seven. So, a, a decent start to a new team. Well, yeah. So I'm looking forward to seeing him as well. What do you have anything on Javi Baez now that he's moved to the Mets? Yes, he's played in five games. He's hitting two hundred with two homers, three RBIs. I believe he actually had a, a clutch home run last night against the Marlins. And I believe he almost started a fight against the Marlins <laughs> in his first game. So <laughs> there's that. And he has an OPS of 738. Wow. You know, it, it's, again, an, another amazing person to see let go from a team. I mean, you and I being Rays fans, I know there's been times where you see it's usually just one component that really hits us. You know, it was Longoria several years ago. Then uh, this year... 
Willie Adamas kind of hit, but uh, you know, we got to where we trust Eric Neander. And Eric Neander, the GM for the Rays, he's very clear about things. Uh, I don't have the quote in front of me, but I know one time he just said, you know, I've got to be ruthless. <laughs> okay. Somebody's <laughs> up front about the situation. He He's not like, you know, oh, well, we, we really like these guys and try to do things with them to see what we can help and, and keep them. You know, he says, I have to make a decision. i got to make the best decisions for the organization. You know, and in the case for even for Willie, Willie's now got a great opportunity with uh, with the Brewers. So I digress a little bit, come back to the Chicago Cubs. But, but it does show that there is a different way of doing business. You know, some of us just being straight up about it, you know, not not getting into the details of negotiations and all that. You just say, hey, we, we couldn't come to an agreement, you know, but to go in and say, well, I was really frustrated with it. And, and I was really hoping we could come together on this, but uh, hey. Yeah, uh, that's that's poorly done. So, uh, let's see. Oh, you know who else? Who else got traded by the Cubbies was not a long term guy who just been there for a little bit, and you know, it's since 2019. That was Craig Kimbrell. You know, he's been a closer for the Chicago Cubs for a bit, and uh, now he's with the White Sox. Nice. He didn't have to uproot his whole lifestyle and move across the country. <laughs> I don't even know if he had to move. No, I saw one interview with Kimbrough, and he was just simply said, "Yeah, you know." He says, "Hey, I talked to the wife, and uh, no, we're 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 already there." And the funny thing was, he said even uh, his wife had uh, has a friendship with Liam Hendricks' wife, you know. And Hendricks is the other premier closer, if you will, for the White Sox. So <laughs> he's got a built-in uh, support system, I guess you could say, with his wife doesn't have to meet all new people again or his family. <laughs> They're going to still have the same house. So kudos to Craig Kimbrell. <laughs> and we wish every player's transition is going to be as easy as hopefully we, we uh, it looks like it is going to be for him. Well, let's move on to the Nationals. Mmm, boy. <laughs> Talk about trading people. Man, they, they were busy. The auction block just kept going and going and going as far as trading players here, there, and, you know, uh, geez, what how, what all happened with that, Brandon? Uh, they basically came out, I think, like a week or week and a half before the deadline and said, everybody but Juan Zoto is available, so come on in. And they traded away closer Brad Hand to the Blue Jays, Daniel Hudson, a reliever, to the Padres. Josh Harrison and catcher Jan Gomes to the A's, John Lester to the Cardinals, Kyle Schorber, a former Cub, he went to the Red Sox, and the big trade of Scherzer and trade Turner, they were traded to the Dodgers. That's that's mind numbing, but I mean, and and before we get into that, just just think about that, man. I mean, as many players was at seven or eight that 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 got traded, uh, and. Looking quickly, you see that most of them, except Trey Turner, had contracts that were expiring. So uh, I get some of that. But uh, I, I can't imagine, you know, being Davey Martinez or Juan Soto. You know, it's the day after uh, coming in, was it Friday? Because the deadline was on Thursday. And you walk into the locker room. And you see the equipment manager in there. He's got a little, little thin uh, razor blade, and he's scratching off the names off of these lockers. You know, and and wiping them all down and getting them ready for the new guys to come in. And suddenly, all these names, all these people who've been there, you know, shoulder to shoulder with you, at the beginning of games are are no longer there. They're not going to be in the dugout. They're not going to be there to to have that conversation with. They're they're not going to be there in the sense with Juan Soto being still, uh, you know, such a young puppy. Uh, the mentorship of what they brought to him and the other players on the team, it's gone. It's it's absolutely gone. I I imagine it's really jarring to all of a sudden be, you know, basically the only guy left, and all of a sudden where, you know, you weren't the like top dog so to speak. You were one of you were arguably the best player, but you weren't looked at as the leader. Now all of a sudden you're not only the best player, but you're the leader of the team, and you're gonna be help help mentoring the guys that are coming in in the next couple of years. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that, that's kind of weird when you think about it, because he was still probably underneath the, like said, other people's wings. Now he has to take those new folks underneath his, and uh, it's going to be a challenge. I, I don't know. I mean, if you're that player or if you're that manager, like Davey Martinez, you know, what, what do you do? I mean, 
you still have to try to put together a team to win games. You got to do that for your team, for their health and for their attitude, and certainly for the fans. But it's got to be difficult. I've always wondered, you know, you, you'll see a team trades trade for a pitcher, and the next night or two, they're with that other team and they're pitching. And I thought, this guy has never really communicated necessarily with that catcher. You know, <laughs> and th- there's a reason that like uh, that pitcher, uh, pitchers and catchers meet at spring training a week earlier than everybody else because they got to be able to communicate. But so uh, without going down that road, it is interesting. They, they do have to be able to, to learn one another's signals. Uh, you have to learn all the little peccadillos of the new players coming into your, uh, into your dugout as well. So, uh, what, what, so what, let's take a look at it with Scherzer. What actually happened there? Are you talking about like what he did last night or like leading up into this? Let's talk about what leading into this. I mean, his contract was one of the ones that were expiring, right? There he is with the Nationals. Great pitcher. And, um, and now he's moved to the Dodgers. So, yeah, go ahead and, and take a look at what he's done recently to give us some of the stats on Scherzer. Yeah, recently, as last night Scherzer made his debut with the Dodgers, he went seven innings, only giving up two runs, both of them earned, one walk and ten strikeouts. So, I mean, he was a typical Max Scherzer, and I'm sure it was even better for them because it came against the Do- – or not against the Dodgers, it came against the Astros. <laughs> yeah, I, I heard them all cheering on Altuve when he came into the Dodgers stadium. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, uh, yeah, that had to help. That was as far as being able to get ten strikeouts. I mean, that's what you'd love to see for any of your pitchers to be able to to bring into a game. Yeah, and they they also got Trey Turner, but he hasn't played a game yet because he's still on the COVID IL, mm. and he's expected or they're expecting him to return on Friday. Now the Nationals, he didn't. He was the one player of the seven or eight that they traded that. Uh, did not have a contract that was expiring. They still had one year more of control with him. Let's see. And he began with them, I think, back in 2015. 2016, he, let's see, he, oh, he's rookie of the year. He's been an MVP. And in 2021, he was also at the All Stars. Trey Turner, even though he's not as a free agent yet, I guess through arbitration, he's able to get a $13 million salary. You know, that's what he had before, I mean, coming to the Dodgers. And I I imagine that still stands. And he will not be a free agent until 2023. Wow. Yeah, and Rizzo came out and said that they they traded him this year instead of waiting for the offseason because he would be more valuable with a year and a half left versus just one year left. Yeah, that that makes sense. Well, Crazy days, but crazy days. I mean, there was a lot that came out of these uh, trade deadlines that I didn't expect. And uh, oh, I know one that's kind of interesting too. Outside of all of this, I mean, is there anything else you want to talk about the Nationals or Cubs? Oh, um, we can kind of go into what Rizzo was saying about the Nationals. Let's do that. Yeah, they, like. give, give me a little bit more on this. Tell me, tell me what's going there. Yeah, well, I, I believe the Nationals are in a better spot because Rizzo became the GM of the Nationals back in '09. And they lost 103 games that Pardon season. Me. And they lost tonight. When you say Rizzo, I, w- I want to make sure folks know that you're not talking about Anthony Rizzo. Oh, no, I'm not. I'm talking about uh, Mike Rizzo. I'll just call him Mike Rizzo from Thank now you. on. <laughs> but he he, be, he became the GM in 09. They lost 103 and then 93 games that next year. And then they were one game under 500 in 2011. And they won and then over the next eight seasons, they finished above 500, and that led to a World Series. So I believe they do have some optimism because he has built up the team to a World Series contender and World Series champion. And not only that, but they got guys back from the Dodgers who are either just around the corner from being Major League ready or who have already played in the majors, so that'll help speed up the rebuild. And the players that they got back were higher valued prospects so it's basically this seems like it's going to be a quick rebuild and it won't be as bad and they handled it better because they went and told the guys it's probably we're probably going to be traded and Davey Martinez said him and Scherzer talked that about two days before and they were both you know they were happy they were sad they were crying just and and laughing because of everything that they've accomplished together so it just seemed like this was handled much better 
the way that the Cubs should have handled it. And the Nationals, I think, could could be playoff contenders in another couple of years because they got the higher valued prospects back that are either major league ready or maybe a year or two away. Well, and that's the thing to consider is because as much as I like to criticize these GMs for some of these moves and seeing popular players that are maybe at their peak, some of them may be a bit waning, you know, I'm not. And Anthony Rizzo from the Cubs and, you know, now with the Yankees has proven at the moment that he's still worth more. Mike Rizzo from the GM from the uh, Nationals uh, telling his story. I, I, I'm glad to hear that it sounds like it was done in a bit more of a, a humane way. And uh, it's led Mike, Max Scherzer actually had it in his contract that uh, I guess he could reject any trade location. So he didn't give him specifics. He said uh, he'd like to be on the West Coast, and they gave him that. And it, it just felt a little more friendly or a little bit more humane, I think, with what happened with the Nationals. Yeah, it felt like more like good business, the way you're supposed to treat your they're, – they're not – your employees really they're more like your partners that seems like the way you're supposed to treat people especially all that they've done for you over the past almost 10 years at this point yeah and honestly when you think about the players these gms treat them and like uh like a commodity like just base baseball cards and maybe that's a little callous makes a little cold but it is part of the game and there's a lot of parts of this game I'm not a big fan of. And the whole idea of keeping a player for six years before they're a free agent and they can make any serious money, uh, you know, with a team that's worth over $3 billion, $3 billion, there's, there's something that's not right there. Uh, and, you know, we're not going to get into this show, but there's a lot of people talking about it already. And that's about how minor league teams are treated because ownership – has the money. MLB has the money. They wanted to be one baseball. They wanted to cut the number of minor league teams. It happened. And part of that was to be for the uh, welfare of the players and those minor league teams. Brandon, you got to catch me. Sometimes I go off uh, on a tangent here, but <laughs> this this is one of these things that just sticks in my craw when I think about what some of these uh, owners are doing or not doing. Uh, yeah, I know. We could just do a one baseball show and I can just sit back and let you take the wheel and go for hours. It seems like you could talk about this. I mean, it's something that I, I can tell you're really passionate about. Yeah, you know, you, you got to you got to rein me in just about every every show anyway. <laughs> <laughs> oh, but but talking about people like in the manners and before they get there or after they get there. You know, I always think about the, the young players in high school and college and I think of the Olympics. But uh, this year in the Olympics, the USA does have a baseball team in there. And it's been a while since they've won. But when I, when I think of that Olympic team, I'm thinking of high school students. I'm thinking of college students. But that, uh, that passed long ago. So it's, you're going to find a lot of the major league or some major league play, players in those teams or on those teams. And We've certainly seen the case. Uh, who was it from the Jap- J- was it the Japan uh, team the other day? Um, Tanaka. Tanaka. Yeah. Can you imagine? Yeah, Tanaka going <laughs> against a high school or a college kid? No. Uh, so, so it's different. But the USA has been fortunate, and they have they lost to Japan, I, I guess, a few games back. So they were in was it kind of a subcategory and tried to work their way back. And where are they right now? Let's see. They they played. Early this morning, yesterday, I think they, they played the Dominican Republic and they defeated them. Who was it this morning, Brandon? Who they? Um, it was Korea. Korea. And they defeated them. And that brings them back into contention for a gold medal game with Japan. And that's going to be very, very interesting. So I guess they'd win a silver medal if nothing else. <laughs> and fun fact. The U.S. softball team actually played Japan in the gold medal game. Well, they unfortunately lost it, but hopefully the baseball team can get some revenge and, and get the gold. That would be sweet. Well, it's been another crazy week here at Baseball Biz. But before we depart, Brandon, any last things we should be topping off? Any other things that we want to talk about the trade deadlines? 
Um, no, I, I believe we got it all covered. I mean, unless I'm missing something. I don't think so. I'm sure there's things that we that'll come to light that were said in dark lit back rooms and money was going to be exchanged hands and trades that were being discussed that never ha- happened. But that's for uh, a large book that will come out later from Baseball Biz. <laughs> 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 oh, gosh. Well, we want to thank all you for joining us today here on Baseball Biz. And as always, remember, you can find Brandon on Twitter at Sports Blitz Pod. That's at Sports Blitz Pod. And you can find me, Mark, at The Baseball Biz on Twitter. Uh, and you can also find us on podcast directories everywhere Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, you name it. We're out there. Uh, please go ahead and subscribe to us and comment. Send us some love. And we look forward to talking with you guys again real soon. Like, rate, and review, too. That's it. Say it one more time, man. Like, rate, and review, too. All right, people. Thank you all. (laughs) (laughs) All right. And special thanks also to X-Tech RUX for the music rocking forward.